Okay, thank you very much, Hans, and uh, good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening to all of you, and thanks for your interest for this uh, presentation we've scheduled for you for the coming hour. Uh, together with my colleague Farid from Ecofis, we're an advisory company on sustainable energy uh, from Western Europe. Uh, we have done a number of analyses together with the European Copper Institute in the past year on a, on a quite interesting question, actually. It's about the progress towards high renewable power systems and how that is actually unfolding, which directions are different regions taking, and what can we actually learn from that. Uh, the direction globally in every country is going towards more renewables in the system to support the decarbonization goals and climate mitigation targets. Some are progressing faster than other ones. And the discussion can, can be tackled from, from various angles. We hear a lot of discussion on, on technology level, on cost reduction level, on, on market design, etc. But the aim of the flexibility tracker is actually to look at everything which is happening in a specific region, most often said a country, uh, to learn which buttons are pushed to make higher shares of renewables possible, which are the barriers, and which are the main attention points in that country, actually. Make it measurable, allow it to be compared to that of other countries, and draw some conclusions for individual countries, individual power systems. What is working well? What can you learn from your neighbors? And what are the main recommendations to, to progress further in your country towards even higher levels of, uh, of renewables? Today, we will say a few words about the, uh, the methodology itself. Uh, just to bring everybody up to speed about how the, the concept is defined, uh, what do the numbers mean, what is the general framework of looking at an individual power system. And then we will dive into what it actually uh, tells us about uh, the state of play in South Africa, what is happening there in the future power system, what are the ongoing evolutions, how is the flexibility readiness of the South African power system, how does it relate to other countries, and what are useful or essential uh, steps going forward. Uh, as said, the discussion will focus mainly on the concept and uh, uh, the application to South Africa itself. As said, we have done this exercise together with the Copper Alliance for a number of countries in the past year. Uh, for example, some European countries like uh, Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Spain, Poland, Italy and Denmark, and also for some non-European countries like India and, and South Africa, which really gives us a very interesting view of looking at what is happening worldwide and uh, what countries could actually learn from each other. It gives like a, you could say, a common language of, 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 uh, of communicating with each other, what can we learn from, uh, from other countries. So uh, if you have, are more interested in the analysis of other countries, uh, I would advise, of course, to take a look at the website of, uh, of the Copper Alliance for those other country reports. Let's start with uh, well, a few basic considerations. We're talking about the readiness of power systems to accommodate high shares of renewable uh, in the system, uh, quantified in terms of how flexible is the system. What is flexibility of a power system? It's, you can define it as the extent to which a power system can adapt generation and consumption to maintain, to maintain power system stability in a, in a cost-effective manner. So it's the ability to respond to sudden changes which happen constantly, of course, in a, in a small and in a large power system. How can demand and, uh, and generation interact with each other? What are the other tools we have at our disposal in the system to make all of that work in a reliable and cost-effective manner? That's what flexibility aims to, to do. Sometimes you will see signs of inflexibility in a power system. And some examples which uh, some countries had experienced, some experienced some items more than other ones, are, for example, recurring very severe frequency excursions, which shows an imbalance between generation and demand, or frequent curtailment of renewable sources, or a need for redispatch quite often, uh, control errors in an area which are also signs of imbalance between generation and demand, substantial significant negative market prices, which are sometimes being kept and sometimes are being very drastic, and both of those situations tell us something. A high price volatility, sometimes even loss of load, and sometimes even unprofitable generation with overcapacity. And all of these items could be linked to a level of inflexibility in the power system. Not all of them are truly problematic. If you go towards a system with very high shares of renewables, some of these items which may seem strange today will become common practice, like perhaps even price volatility, price spikes, uh, perhaps a moderate share of renewable curtailment. If you think about systems with renewable levels of 80% or more, 
that may become common practice. But sometimes these are also symptoms that something is is not going optimal on the power system. And if you think about, can we push it further? Can we go to even higher levels of renewables? This, this deserves some attention and uh, give some items to uh, to be fixed, of course. The aspect of flexibility in power systems it's, is it really something you can you can you can measure, or is it just a very uh, loose uh, qualitative aspect? Uh, well, to some extent, the, the the flexibility aspect has always been uh, a useful measure in, in power systems for, for decades, of course. Uh, decades ago, in systems which were vertically integrated, which only had very large conventional generation, there always was a measure, of course, of how much spare generation is available. That is a measure of flexibility, actually. If you go towards a more uh, uh, unbundled market with, uh, with self-dispatch of generations, open markets. Uh, system operators may be keen to understand, do I have enough tools to cope with sudden changes of generation and demand? Can I ramp up and down fast enough? That could also be measured in megawatts per, per hour, for example. It could be a measure of flexibility in a power system. You could also go to the essence of the question. Can I operate my system in a reliable manner? Is it? Can I really avoid loss of load? Uh, if you do an analysis of a power system and you quantify that there is some expectation of loss of load, could also be a measure actually of the level of flexibility or inflexibility of a power system. The question we're really addressing here is uh, with more and more increases of, of renewables, which measures are at your disposal to accommodate that? How much of is it available? At which cost? Uh, is it something you can do at a local level? Or does it require more international coordination? Do we look only at electricity or also at other energy vectors? All of these elements are somehow related to the question, is my power system flexible, yes or no? And we try to, to integrate them all into a flexibility measure, actually. Uh, to again sketch, actually, what all power systems are facing worldwide when they go to systems with more, more renewable uh, energy uh, integrated. If you would think about your demand curve all over the year, it, uh, it goes up and down, of course, depending on time of day, time of week, uh, time of year. If you would sort them all, you would see something like a residual load curve. You would have an understanding, what is the peak load in my system on the very left, uh, and how often am I at 50% of my peak load, how often am I at a base load situation. If you would think about variable renewable energy sources, that's the topic we will refer to a lot in this, in this topic on flexibility of power systems. If you would think about variable renewable sources like uh, wind and solar and to a lesser extent some, some hydro, uh, they're intermittent. Uh, they depend on weather conditions. Let's say you would subtract them from your uh, load curve. You would get something like a residual load curve. What you would actually see in your system is that your peak load at year level will probably reduce just a tiny bit. Your 50% residual load situation will drop a lot. And your base load, which you used to have in the past, may not be there anymore. You may have situations in the year, especially if you go to very high shares of renewables, where you actually have a surplus of variable renewable energy sources. And if you then think about the tools you had at your disposal in the past to operate the system, that really turns everything upside down. look again at what flexibility used to mean and what it can mean in the future. In the past, flexibility was actually uh, uh, was a need for flexibility to cope with demand variations. As said, it evolves over the year, over the day, over the week, and to cope with sudden losses of supply. For example, a generator going into maintenance or actually dropping out because of a failure. And flexibility used to be provided at national level via conventional plants. And as said, if you go to a situation with higher shares of variable renewable sources, your flexibility need will increase. Uh, if you think about the demand curve and you subtract the intermittent generation, you have actually much larger spread between peak situations and base situations. Your situation where you may have to cope with uh, supply losses is still something you have to cope with. But your historical provision of flexibility sources by means of conventional generators, they're decreasing. They're being pushed out of the system because they're less profitable. They're being replaced by renewable generations. And if you don't do anything, you end up with something we, we used to call a flexibility gap. You have a higher need, but less resources. But you can still make your system flexible by relying on demand for flexibility, 
more storage in the system, and more supply flexibility also from renewable sources, for example. And to which extent are those measures being pushed, actually? To which extent are you avoiding that you end up with a flexibility gap, and that you end up perhaps with the ambition of more renewable sources, but you cannot operate it securely, or alternatively, that a country may think, I will not go for more renewables because I cannot manage, manage and that's the reason to put a brake on decarbonization uh, ambitions. That's a bit of the background of, of uh, the flexibility challenge. How can you tackle flexibility questions? Well, you can look at it from a technology perspective. Uh, what can research learn us? Where is the industry evolving towards? What do I learn from pilot projects? You can look at all sorts of needs in the system, adequacy analysis, stability analysis, uh, cost-benefit analysis, and so forth. You can also try to analyze what are really the hurdles and the barriers in the system to promote more flexibility sources. And from all of that, you can deduce what is actually needed as action at a national level, at a local level, at a wider international level. The flexibility tracker does not monitor uh, progress in, in technology. It's not an, an, uh, a real system analysis tool like you would do, for example, for system stability or adequacy. It's really focusing on all possible hurdles and barriers in the system and the kind of actions you could take to make sure your power system is flexible. Actually, the framework we have uh, set up, discussed with several stakeholders and used in the application of several country analysis, is to look at flexibility options in five broad categories. Uh, three flexibility sources. Flexibility can be provided in the power system by demand flexibility. It can come from industry, can come from small scale demand. Flexibility can come from the supply side, uh, being able to ramp up and ramp down generation and feed. And flexibility can also come from storage, which can, of course, absorb or inject uh, power back into the system. Those are really flexibility sources. They do something with the infeed in the system. And then you have two flexibility enablers, we call them, grid flexibility and market flexibility. You need to have a well-developed grid, a well-operated grid, to make sure everything is well-connected in an efficient way and variable renewable generation can find and consumer demand, of course. And you need to have the markets or the mechanisms, at least, to let all these actors interact. Uh, variable renewable sources are quite often smaller scale entities. Demand flexibility and storage flexibility may also come from smaller scale entities. It could all function, of course, in a vertically integrated company, uh, like still exists in the various countries across the world, partially also in South Africa, of course. But if you go towards more unbundled systems, those markets really need to be very well developed to cope with these new evolutions, of course. So what is the flexibility tracker concept uh, we, we came up with to be able to analyze individual countries and learn something from them? It's actually a set of 14 flexibility KPIs and a set of 80 standardized questions to, to give scores to those KPIs. So we have the five flexibility categories I uh, just mentioned, three providers and two enablers. And all five of those, we've broken them down again into two or three sub-elements, which are the flexibility KPIs. And you see them all listed here, ranging from conventional generation flexibility over bulk storage flexibility towards retail market flexibility. And all of those items, if they are well-developed, they are a support in keeping your system flexible. And if they're less well-developed, that's perhaps not a problem for a country, but you need to be aware of it, and you need to understand which are actually the flexibility tools I'm strongly promoting in my country? And is it enough to have untapped potential? And what will I need to resolve if I want to go for even higher shares of renewables? That's what makes this setup, this schematic of 40 flexibility KPIs, quite an interesting tool to, to absorb all that information and to, to compare actually countries, as, as just said. Uh, so if we have our 14 flexibility KPIs for the topics just mentioned. Uh, practically, the numbers you will see in a moment uh, for this specific application of South Africa. What does a KPI mean? Uh, all of the 14 flexibility KPIs, we give them a scoring uh, on, a, on a scale of uh, 0 to 5. 0 means low readiness, 5 means high readiness. Uh, the 80 questions I just mentioned, uh, they are standardized. They are, well, they are smart, they're measurable. Uh, they're based on thresholds and weighting factors, and they allow us to uh, collect information based on those 80 questions and let them result in one to five scores for those 14 flexibility KPIs. 
So what does a high flexibility score mean? There's a lot of potential in the country, or there's a lot of application, or there's a lot of policy incentives, or a lot of research, or any combination thereof. And a low score means, well, not much is actually happening at, at the moment yet. So that's how the flexibility tracker KPI setup uh, could be understood. I hope that clarifies a bit the, the language and the mechanism we developed uh, together with the Copper Alliance to, to look at a, f a number of interesting countries. As I said, we've applied it already to a, a series of countries in the past years. And uh, it also gave us an interesting view of how to look at the, the South Africa's power system. So that being said, uh, I'll hand over to you, Farid, for the views on uh, the South Africa power system where it is at the moment and what we learned from our flexibility tracker analysis. Okay, um, thank you, Edwin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, from my side. Um, so exactly, I will, uh, before presenting the, the analysis, the results of the Flex Tracker for South Africa, I would like to give you a state of play of the power system in, in South Africa, what's the current situation, and what is the future outlook in South Africa according to the uh, studies that are undergoing in the country. So um, what is the current situation in South Africa is that uh, we have uh, ESCOM, the vertically integrated utility of the country, uh, which is responsible for generating, transmitting, and almost distributing all the energy. Uh, it's facing a lot of uh, actually um, economic losses. And these losses are transferred over the whole value chain of the electricity system. And let me explain what this means. Um, this means that uh, because ESCOM is facing a lot of challenges lately, um, this comes from the blackout that it experienced in 2008 and 2014. It comes from the limited reserve that they have and the aging infrastructure. And uh, because of these events and the fact that 60% of the population in South Africa has free access to electricity, there is a mismatch between um, the cost of generating electricity and the revenues. and ESCOM has been obliged to, rise, to, to increase the electricity prices since 2008 by an average of 20% every year. At the same time, municipalities who are distributing the electricity, they have um, a cap on how much they can increase the tariffs. So this, in, this increase from ESCOM is causing shrinking revenues from municipalities who at the same time can no longer maintain, maintain their distribution um, uh, grids. Therefore, here you see the first transfer of losses over the value chain of electricity. Um, the second transfer uh, comes with actually uh, renewable power plants. Um, so in 2011, actually, South Africa um, decided to open the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producer Agreement, which led to really uh, a lot of investment in renewable energy in the country. Uh, the graph that you see on the left is um, what in green is basically what is uh, currently bid, what is being currently built in the country, and the orange is the line that that are the the tender bids. And usually, um, we say that in a, a renewable energy power plant needs two years to be commissioned. And you can see in the blue line is this these two year, this two year gap is basically increasing. So there is basically a growing gap between the tender auctions and the commissioning. And why is this uh, happening? Um, because actually ESCOM is refusing to uh, connect the grid scale renewables and signing 20 years PPA. Why is it refusing? Because um, the cost of these PPAs are actually higher than the operating cost of its coal power plants. So ESCOM is losing money with having more renewable energy in the country. Um, and there's a conflicting views between now two ministries in the country between the Department of Energy, who's trying to push for renewables, and the Ministry of Public Enterprises, who is responsible to cover these losses. So this is, of course, a debate between in the country between subsidizing renewables or not uh, over 20 years. But this is, the, this is the current situation. There is a, a, a conflict between ESCOM and the renewable power plants. What is the impact of this of this conflict? Well, it will decrease the appetite of renewable investors to invest in the country. South Africa might not meet its national determined contribution for the Paris Agreement, and South Africa is basically not exploiting its really high uh, wind and solar resources. It's left untapped. So uh, what is the future outlook now? Um, now that was the current situation. What is the future outlook for South Africa? 
Uh, well, the integrated resource plan was actually published um, last November. The draft was published, and it wanted to answer these eight objectives. Uh, ensure security of supply, minimize cost of energy, promote energy access, energy efficiency. So you can see this eight, these were the eight objectives of the integrated resource plan for the next 40 years. Um, I want to present you now a summary of uh, of this integrated resource plan and the scenarios that they ha that they have analyzed, and um, what are the results. Um, the best case scenario, which is the the scenario where they will build quite, uh, they will expand uh, nuclear energy in the country, and uh, still count coal into as a clean coal they will still count coal as a clean coal uh, energy supply and they would like to equip it with carbon capture and storage so this is the base case scenario where it's still like yeah okay there won't be really a lot of renewable energy in the country and then there's the environmental awareness the green shoot resource constraint scenario you can see in the in the table that I've drawn um, that shows the the normalization of each category and the 100% mean that it's the most cost efficient, it's the highest grading. And one can read that the base case scenario, according to the study of the integrated energy resource plan of the government, turns out to be the best scenario for South Africa, which again says that South Africa is not ready to move. I mean, the government at the moment is not ready to move to a more energy, sustainable energy supply. Um, of course, it's debatable. The numbers are debatable. The assumptions are debatable. And that's actually what happened in the country. This, this report ignited a lot of critiques from different uh, institutes in the country that I would like to present to you uh, in a short slide. Um, there's the, Corp the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR. There was uh, the Energy Intensive User Group. There was the Organization of Undoing Tax Abuse, the South African Renewable Energy Council, of course. And all these, these, these institutes actually dissected the, the, the Department of Energy draft plan and came to these, these critiques. Number one, why is nuclear power uh, assumed to be a uh, needed uh, energy supply for South Africa? Then the renewable energy investments are very limited. They are they don't really take into account the full capacity of renewables. Uh, the assumptions are very debatable. So uh, there is an overestimation of the demand needed in the country, which actually really impacts how much coal you need or how much nuclear you need. The cost assumptions of of nuclear are very low, and the one of the renewables are very high. Uh, the technology learnings of renewable energy are not really taken into account. And finally, of course, it's a very basic basic methodology. There is no optimal dispatch, and they are just using capacity factors and technology cost curves assessment to determine the energy mix. So in answer to this draft, um, the CSIR actually conducted uh, a full optimization scenario, taking into account the assumptions of uh, the Department of Energy and a least cost approach, which is more focused on the wind and solar and flexible power generator. These are uh, gas power plants and there is batteries involved. And uh, it took the base case scenario and it ran it in, in its optimization software. So you can see on the right, I've, I've drawn for you what, what are the similar inputs and what are the differences. And uh, the differences are mainly the, the, the PV, wind, and gas cost. And it includes system stability cost. And there is more market modeling tools. And they still kept the same cost for the conventional energy, the same capex cost. And uh, the, the study come to the conclusion that wind, solar, and flexible power, power generator is the least cost option for South Africa. It can save, you can see in the, in the bottom box, around $60 billion um, dollar per year um, compared to, to the base case. Uh, the cost of electricity in the country is lower. There will be less CO2 emissions in the country and less consumption of fresh water, and more jobs will be created, which are the eight objectives of the IRP. So uh, of course, there's a debate um, how these results can be taken in the IRP, but this is the current situation in the country. So now. How did I use all this information to, to actually rate uh, South Africa for the flexibility tracker? 
Um, so um, our analysis actually shows that uh, South Africa is lagging behind in the global transition to low carb because of the, the current trust plan of uh, uh, of the government. And uh, you can see here, the, the like Edwin explained before, the flexibility providers and the flexibility enablers, we have rated each category. Um, South Africa is present, it presents a, a good, uh, good, uh, good score in terms of demand, which I will explain why, and it's almost a red score in all other flexibility uh, uh, categories. And on the right side, you see the overall graph that, that we do for each country, and you can see in which, in, in which detailed uh, indicator is how is uh, South Africa being graded. So, um, like I mentioned before, demand is the only flexibility uh, is, a, is, a, is a flexibility provider that uh, that we found uh, that had enough action and awareness, that had enough application and clear incentives. So we gave it the orange score. Um, so there is there has been like ESCOM was actually has been able to reduce uh, demand in the country by deploying uh, CFL lights. Uh, there is stringent efficiency standards in the country. There is a compulsory of installing solar water heaters for new buildings, so that's a good point for energy efficiency. In terms of demand response, uh, South Africa is the first uh, country in, in, in Africa to have open uh, a demand response pilot project in 2012, and it's running now um, in the country uh, a, a project where 0 0.5 gigawatt of, uh, of demand could be um, uh, managed. Uh, in terms of supply and storage, um, well, this is where I was looking at the Department of Energy and um, draft. And of course, since they want to install more nuclear, they want still to go for coal, uh, renew and renewables are denied grid connections. Uh, the supply gets uh, gets a negative score. Um, in terms of storage, um, this is maybe the, the, the weakest point in terms of flexibility for South Africa. Uh, there is absolutely no plan to incentivize batteries in the future because there is no plan to go for renewables. Uh, there is no long-term view on sector coupling between uh, transport and heating, and the potential of pump storage is totally limited. Um, in terms of uh, flexibility enablers, um, I, uh, in South Africa there is actually um, a good, uh, a good cooperation at the moment between TSO and DSO, which is uh, uh, which is the advantage of having a vertically integrated utility, let's say, because the co the, the cooperation is easier, and uh, uh, renewables are mandated to be equipped with reactive power control functions, uh, which is something quite advanced for for the country at at the right at the at the moment now. Um, for the wholesale market, um, the, the wholesale market exists in South Africa since 2005, and uh, it it's, it has a low liquidity, but the volume increased by five times since it was uh, in, uh, since it was founded. So therefore, it's a positive uh, it's a positive flexibility enabler. Uh, in terms of interconnections and retail market, the interconnections uh, have been delayed in South Africa. There, there, so um, there is a there is a, a delay in the interconnections, and the planning methods of the South African power pool is not really harmonized between all countries. Uh, in contrary to to Europe, where uh, the planning methods is really harmonized in, in, at the NCOE, the European Network Transmission System Operator, there is the same methods for transmission operators. To, to build their planning methods in South Africa, this is not the case. So again, this is not uh, the, the good approach to go for more renewables in the, in the continent. And uh, for the retail market, um, there's a big barrier in the retail market that uh, it can be perceived as a retail as a big barrier. 50% of the population receives free electricity, so there is no incentive for them to really uh, be uh, reduce their energy or be uh, ready to to go into uh, any sort of uh, demand response agreements and uh, or be be exposed to variable electricity prices, which is really a, an advanced topic in Europe. So overall, this is um, this this is the analysis for uh, flexibility for the flexibility tracker in South Africa. And in the next slide, I would like to compare it to other countries that we have analyzed. 
And here you can see in green, in bolded green, is South Africa. And uh, you have India, you have Germany in blue, and you have Poland. So you can see that South Africa, in comparison to Poland, is not in doing so 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 bad. And India is more advanced than South Africa, especially in terms of energy efficiency targets and large scale demand side management, in terms of also the interconnections that are being built. Uh, South Africa still has some positive um, aspects, which are really um, the, the demand side management program that it has uh, lately uh, enacted and its wholesale market. Um, Germany as a whole is, of course, uh, has a better overall score compared to, to South Africa, and there's actually some some lessons that we can learn from, from Germany to really push for a higher renewable energy supply, and this is what I would like to present in the next slide, which is what what has Germany done to actually push for a fast transition. Um, number one, Germany has really adapted its policies and its pricing mechanism according to how the market for renewable energy supply is developing. So at the right point in time, it switched from a filial tariff policy to a renewable energy auction scheme to actually reduce the cost of integrating renewables uh, on, on a large scale. The second point that, that that was very important in the energy transition in Germany was to really um, democratize energy and uh, empower the citizens to actually go into community ownerships and have a higher empowerment to make money out of investing in renewables. This actually also increased the public acceptance for renewable energy. So by providing this low risk investment schemes to renewable energy, the, the citizens could themselves invest and this is a sort of democratization of the energy supply. And this led to an exponential growth in community energy investment in Germany. And third point is uh, city leadership in Germany has played also a, paramount, a, a big role in, in, let's say, in accepting the fact that we need to go, that we need to leave coal behind and go into more renewable energy leadership. So I know that South Africa is a, is a coal intensive country, but what, what, what Germany is doing now with its old coal mine plants, it's turning them into pump storage plants to actually integrate more renewable energy and creating and still creating more jobs. So the transition to renewable energy should not be perceived per se as a, as a risk of losing jobs for coal. No, it, it's, it's about switching to the right, in the right transition and transform using coal to actually create some storage plant. And since South Africa has a lack of storage, this could be an example of what, how, how, how can we use uh, future coal mines in South Africa. To finally give our recommendations um, going forward, I would like to say that there is, we have short-term, mid-term, and long-term uh, recommendations. And the first short-term recommendation is to create a, a, a serious long-term sustainable energy vision. Uh, we would recommend to, to base it on the CSIR scenario. This would provide investors more confidence in, in, in investing in the country and would clarify what is the, the stance of the government towards renewable energy supply. Um, the second short-term recommendation would be to really prioritize the expansion of interconnections because this is the, mo the most cost-efficient way to integrate renewable energy supply uh, on a, between neighboring countries. And uh, this, the, the third short-term recommendation would be to prepare a rollout of smart meters because we w this will be needed to actually uh, integrate more local renewable energy supply. And then gather best practices from large-scale demand response programs like in the US to actually understand how we could implement aggregators in reserve markets. Uh, Midterm, mid we're looking at 2025 and above. Uh, 
we uh, South Africa should start thinking about inf incentivizing uh, renewable energy supply to provide grid support services, and uh, it should implement uh, interconnection, higher interconnection ambitions looking beyond 2025 and 2030, because at the moment the plan is just for the next five, six years. On the long on the long term response to integrate higher shares of renewable energy, um, there must be uh, there must be a way to ensure always adequate resources under low variable renewable supply events. So um, this is a topic of uh, of current research in Europe, and uh, this is, would be a long term recommendation to follow for South Africa. Um, we have to maximize the end use flexibility options, and this is via uh, demand response programs at the local level. So 50% of the population having free electricity prices will definitely not work in a high renewable energy supply scenario for South Africa. So this has to be considered to change. And uh, the market process timings uh, should be adapted for renewable energy supply. And that is really uh, if we dig into the market design of the wholesale market, balancing market in South Africa, this, this, all these whole time spans need to be adapted to a more uh, variable renewable energy supply. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank you all for your for listening. And um, if you have any questions, uh, Edwin and I are very happy to answer your questions. And uh, these are our contact details. Uh, if you would like to contact us, and uh, like Edwin said, we have uh, already um, applied the flexibility tracker in different countries in Europe, include and India. So, and this is uh, available on uh, the on the TI uh, website.